Australia is separated from New Zealand by a 3,000 kilometre wide stretch of water called the Tasman Sea. Just off our coastline, it is four kilometres deep. Our two lands stand in stark contrast to each other. Australia is a wide brown land, mostly desert, increasingly hot and so worn down that its rivers flow inland, building salt. Its poor soils are mostly coastal and under threat by people who do not listen to scientists. Earthquakes are usually small. New Zealand has impressive mountains, huge active fault lines and earthquakes, glaciers, fjords and snow, scary volcanoes and rich volcanic soils that go with them. What is generally not known is that for much of its geological history, New Zealand lay just off our east coast. This is its story, the story of ancient Zealandia. Zircon crystals form in a range of igneous rocks, are almost as hard as diamond and have very high melting points. They contain two radioactive isotopes of uranium that decay very slowly to lead, allowing us to date the oldest rocks. Aussie-sensitive high-resolution iron microprobe machines hit the centre parts of the crystal with plasma beams and date the vapour. In the Jack Hills region in West Australia, the world's oldest piece of crystal has been found. Dating 4.40 billion years, just 200 million years after the Sun and Solar System formed. The western two-thirds of our continent are very old worn-down areas that we call cratons. Craton rocks are metamorphic and are Proterozoic and Archaean in age. Over time, three Paleozoic fold belts have welded on to the east and are less than 550 million years old. The oldest rocks in New Zealand formed next to the fold belts that are shown in red and purple. At the beginning of the Permian, eastern Australia had a number of basins in blue and yellow wedged between two fold belts shown in mauve. The sediments deposited there formed our flat-lying basin rocks. This was the time when the last supercontinent, Pangaea, formed from various bits and pieces. Move forward to the early Cretaceous and Antarctica and Australia are restive companions. We've forgotten Zealandia, shown in mauve and half the size of Australia. The present position of New Zealand is shown in a darker colour. Notice that Zealandia is in collision with the Pacific Plate. Over 400 million years, it had formed offshore volcanic islands and shallow and deep water sedimentary basins that fill with sediments such as sandstone, siltstone, limestone and deep water grey whackers. Subduction crunched these sediments, changing them into solid, tilted, fold belt mountains that welded on to the east of Australia and Antarctica. By this time, eastern Gondwana, including Zealandia, had worn down to sea level. What followed was the rise of more basalt magmas, followed by rifting. Oceans begin with the formation of a rift valley and the extrusion of basalt magmas. This widens to seas or oceans, with central mid-oceanic rises 
broken by transcurrent faults. The age of the oceanic crust can be dated by magnetic striping and radioactive dating. The colours green and gold between Australia and New Zealand tell us that New Zealand rifted off from Australia between 60 and 85 million years ago, forming the Tasman Sea. Further expansion stopped when Australia and Antarctica separated slowly at first, then rapidly as the Great Southern Ocean formed and Australia had its own collision forming the New Guinea highlands. This graphic shows the Australian plate rifting from the thinner New Zealand plate. The tragedy for ancient Zealandia is that it moved further and further into deep water and was mostly submerged. Australia was transformed by the uplift of the Great Dividing Range along our east coast. The highest point is Mount Kosciuszko, 2,228 metres high. The only volcanoes that formed after that were caused by the migration of Australia over basaltic hotspots on its journey north. This is the 16 million year old Warrumbungle volcano. The last Aussie volcano blew out in the Mount Gambier region, South Australia. The lack of modern volcanoes means reducing soil fertility. As well as that, our drought-stricken farmers increasingly rely on underground water, which some fools want to pollute. This is the Australian plate as it is today in orange. The Antarctic plate is the big blue bit to the south. The Tasman Sea and half of New Zealand are on the eastern edge of the Australian plate. Here we see that 93% of ancient Zealandia is submerged, with New Zealand above water. The dark line north of New Zealand is a deep water trench where the Pacific plate dives under the Australian plate. This causes the east of the North Island to be pushed up and some very nasty volcanoes to go bang. You can see a big fault line running through the South Island. We call it the Great Alpine Fault. South of New Zealand, the Dark Trench is on the Australian side. The Australian plate is diving under the Zealandia, a rugby pack. Rocks to the southeast of the fault line are consequently much higher. Zealandia's history is one of sinking, followed by the uplift of New Zealand itself. In the Oligocene epoch 35 million years ago, only one third of present New Zealand was above sea level. Close to its shore, coals, sandstones and muds were deposited and were later uplifted as solid rock and tilted. On the shallow sea shelf, these funny pancake limestone rocks were deposited and are now exposed on the northwest coast of the South Island. The area sank further. By the Miocene epoch, 25 million years ago, most of the solid rock on the seafloor was a hard grey rock called grey wacker. It contains felspar derived from the erosion of granite mountains. You notice that this grey wacker boulder has bigger grains on one side. On the border of ancient Gondwana, sediment poured down submarine canyons onto the abyssal plain with the coarsest sediments settling first. This happened between 350 and 110 million years ago, the sediments being crunched and uplifted by subduction. These hard grey rocks form much of the central spine of New Zealand and are nearly vertical in dip 
in the Mount Cook National Park. The Miocene plate collision was known as the Kaikoura orogeny. The Pacific plate was rammed up over the Australian plate, creating the Alpine fault. Most of the movement was sideways, but there was 20 kilometres of uplift with 16 kilometres of erosion. The movements are fast and increasing. Some of the alpine rocks came from deep in the crust and have been metamorphosed to a flaky, hard, mica-rich rock called schist. Around Otago, this is split and used as a hard building stone. The Alpine Fault branches to the north of the South Island, continues through the New Zealand capital Wellington and heads towards the main North Island volcanic centres. The recent Christchurch earthquake was on a lesser known fault. Buildings including Christchurch Cathedral collapsed. Streets rolled like water waves and water was forced out of the ground, swallowing whole cars. The spectacular scenery of the South Island has two main causes. The first is the rapid uplift of its highlands above the snow line. The second is the violent oscillation of the world's climate over the last two million years. Big glaciers have formed and done their bulldozing work. Typical is Milford Sound. During the last glacial peak 26,000 years ago, the sea level was 130 metres lower. A glacier carved a U-shaped valley in its journey towards the sea. 8,000 years ago, the present warm Holocene epoch began and the sea invaded, forming the fjord. The surrounding cliffs consist of steeply dipping metamorphic rocks and granites. The crust beneath the Taupo volcanic zone is just 16 kilometres thick. A 50 kilometre by 160 kilometre magma lake sits 10 kilometres beneath the ground surface. It is a silica-rich magma capable of more explosive eruptions than the more runny basalt magmas that produced the extinct shield volcanoes near Christchurch in the South Island. The nastiest eruptions produce the caldera lakes of Taupo and Rotorua. This rock scared me when I first collected it. Super hot glass and pumice would have blown out at high speed sideways and incinerated everything in its path. We call it ignimbrite. 26,500 years ago, in the Oranui eruption, the Taupo supervolcano blasted out 1,170 cubic kilometres of material, incinerating much of the North Island. Since then, it has erupted 28 times. The High Tepe eruption of 180 AD ejected 120 cubic kilometres of material in a few minutes. It covered the land with ignimbrite and turned the sky red over Rome and China. The main Rotorua blowout occurred 240,000 years ago and left a small rhyolite dome in the centre of the lake and much geothermal activity on its fringes. Also in the area are younger active andesite volcanic cones that line up on volcanic rifts. They are called stratovolcanoes because they can blast ash into the stratosphere, closing airports and burying anyone close. Take care.